Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar presentation, Live Tech Talk and Demo, Getting Started with DevOps on Snowflake, brought to you by Snowflake. I would like to introduce you to our presenter, Jeremiah Hansen. Jeremiah is currently a senior sales engineer at Snowflake. He has spent the last 20 years in software engineering and consulting, with the last 14 focused on data engineering. And now I'd like to pass it off to Jeremiah. All right, well, thanks. Let's get started. I got a just a quick, you already gave a little overview, but just a quick overview about myself. So I live uh, in the Seattle area. And like Drew mentioned, been in the software engineering space for the past 20 years with the last 14, really around data engineering. Um, and I've kind of been on all sides of it. So I spent the last nine years at Slalom Consulting, uh, leading the cloud data engineering and DevOps practice. So I've been kind of, I've been the delivery side primarily, and then now I'm on the uh, technical sales side at Snowflake. I've just been at Snowflake now, I just passed my one year mark. So it's been awesome. And then I thought just one fun thing for everybody is that I am a, a licensed beer judge. So there's a beer judge certification program that uh, called the BJCP. And it's basically international, but it's about judging home brewers um, and helping them with their homebrew. And I'm a level two, so certified. I got to take a pretty tough test to get to national, but it's coming soon. So anyway, there's a little bit of background about me. So agenda for today, this uh, webinar is about getting started with DevOps on Snowflake. So it's going to be, a, the beginning is going to be an overview. So we'll briefly cover what DevOps is. We'll talk about challenges specifically with doing DevOps for databases, because there's some unique challenges for that. Uh, and then I'll talk specifically about database change management and some approaches. And then always the fun part, we'll do actually a demo of a database change management tool. And I'll show how to even use that in a CI CD pipeline. And then we'll do a quick little sneak peek uh, of a blog post I just wrote around how to kind of rethink database change management with Snowflake uh, using DBT. And we'll have some time at the end for questions and answers. So we got a lot to do in the next hour and let's get let's jump right in. So we'll start here with a brief overview of DevOps. And some of this, if you've done DevOps before, you'll have some understanding, but I, so I like this meme. It's when I threw together uh, for a little Zoolander meme but DevOps really is so hot right now. Everybody's talking about it. And over the last couple of years, I've noticed um, on the consulting side, more and more customers asking about it. And same thing at Snowflake, you know, really everybody now, prospects or customers ask about, how do I do this? How do I automate the processes in Snowflake? So timely topic for sure. There's lots of terms that get thrown around when we talk about DevOps. Sometimes they get used interchangeably uh, when they shouldn't, but all these things are kind of the related to the DevOps space. So agile development's definitely related and uh, release automation. Those are some of the key terms people often use or they'll say continuous integration, CI, CD. Oftentimes people mean the same thing when they use any of those terms. But these are some other, there's other terms on here as well that just cover, you know, what it is that we're, that, that's in scope here for DevOps. I, I found this helpful and Again, you can see the reference at the bottom. It was anything I created, but I found this really helpful to, to really di differentiate what Agile and DevOps is. And I've got two slides that go through this that I think are very helpful. But really at its core, DevOps is about automating those computer uh, activities, the technological and uh, automation aspects, where Agile is really more on the human side. So if, you, if any of you have been on Agile development teams, you'll know that you know, all the things around the designing the stories, the coding, that's all human activities. Um, there's an overlap a little bit between code reviews. Some of that can be automated and testing. Some of it is still human. But then DevOps is all the, the automation pieces. So in addition to the goal is to automate as much of it as you can, but for sure on the like building and deployment side and monitoring, that's where we're focused on DevOps. I found this also, which I think is really helpful. It just puts in perspective, you know, where the dev, where DevOps fits compared to Agile and and that. So if you look at starting at the left side, if if you remember back, like I've been when I started doing software engineering, uh, we were still doing a lot of the waterfall approach. If you're familiar with that, and that approach was basically like a wall between the business and the developers, and 
the business would there'd be a somebody gathering requirements and they would throw those over the wall to the developers who would build the the thing in sort of an isolation i mean there wasn't a lot of interaction with the business and then they would give it back to the business when they were done and it, it turned out oftentimes it wasn't what the business wanted you know they didn't they weren't able to specify clearly enough or requirements changed and so agile really helped address and break down this first wall it helped address the the issues between the business and the developers and devops does the same thing between the developers and the operations team so what had happened for you know for a long time what you did was after you built your application you kind of threw it over to the wall to the operations team and they had to deploy it manage it and all of that and same problem there you know they didn't have the 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 details um, of what was built and how to operate it and you tried to write them up but that conflict that wall of the conflict gets broken down with devops and so we help automate the the whole process end to end so i think that's that's helpful just in terms of framing up what we're trying to do with DevOps. Why does this matter? Why is, you know, why are folks on the call today trying to understand this? Um, some of it might be, you know, trying to fit, you know, you should do DevOps, but there's real practical business benefits for doing DevOps. And, you know, here's a list of some of them, but it, by automating, the whole goal of this is to automate everything and to have, you know, so all the parts of the, the development and operations process is stored in code and and automated so that you can deliver software faster and you can be more efficient. Um, definitely improve quality. Every time you have a person doing something, like if they had to do all the testing, you're going to miss stuff. You know, people are, are human and going to make mistakes and so and can't catch everything. So the more you can automate the testing and the deployment, the the quality of your code and your product will go up which all this translates then into like, you know, being able to deliver things for, for less money, cheaper, and then getting a greater return on your investment. So we can deliver more for the business faster and with less cost if we get DevOps right. So you'll probably hear the term CICD, and I just wanted to at least give you an overview of what I, this is, I think, a helpful uh, representation. And this is what we're talking about. When somebody says CICD, what do they mean? This is what they mean. The, the foundation to everything we're talking about today with DevOps is code. You have to store the definitions for everything you want to do in code. It has to be you know, some centralized repository. So we have that first. And as people make changes and commits to the code, then as soon as commits are made, we want to run some continuous integration pipelines. And these are essentially about testing and validating that the changes that you've made work with everything else and don't break anything. And so part of that process is building the, the code and the applications, running unit tests against the individual pieces, and then running integration tests to make sure that everything works together. And we'll talk a little more about what, what's, what's involved in like an integration test for doing database DevOps in just a second. And then there's a continuous delivery side, which is more about the release, you know, the releasing and delivery of the product. So there are some human steps in here often, um, reviewing, uh, and then going through different pre-production environments. So going through like test and dev and QA, and then ultimately releasing to production. So this is kind of the scope of what we're talking about with, with CICD pipelines. All right, so getting in a little more now into what it means for databases. So <laughs> this diagram is something I put together around the Super Bowl time. Uh, if you can't tell, it was something we were doing internally at Snowflake, but trying to figure, you know, uh, looking like a playbook. So you can see these are the, the kind of football playbook. So this is the DevOps playbook for Snowflake. And if you think about what you have to do to in order to do DevOps for Snowflake, there's a bunch of areas you have to think about. And it's a lot of times when people talk about it, it's not clear what they're talking about. So I think this is helpful to frame up what's there. And then also we can be very then precise with what we're talking about. So if you look at the center, this is like the the quarterback of the play. And my football, I'm not a bit, I don't know much about football, so this is going to break down pretty quick. I'll just only name one of these, which is the like a quarterback. But software automation is all about uh, these tools. Basically, help do. We talked about this. What a CI/CD pipeline is. Well, the software automation tools help manage that and and audit, help provide the tooling to do that to make it possible. So they're they're definitely foundational, and there's lots of them. We'll actually demo one of them today and going right along with that 
again, I don't know what what football player this would be, but source control is also the absolute foundational. You have everything has to be in source control. And we'll we'll do we'll look at a study actually in just a second that talks about you know how often developers actually or database folks actually use source control. It's not not all that often. So these are the foundation. And then around the outside here are all the different areas you have to think about automating. So you might have, you will have cloud resources, whether those are storage accounts, um, serverless compute services, et cetera. You're gonna have you know, one or more of those to manage. If you wanna set up a complete environment, you have to think about what cloud resources you need as part of that. Database change management is what most people mean when they say uh, they want to do DevOps with Snowflake. They really are talking about database change management. And I and part of this slide is to show there's actually more to the picture than just that. But this is the primary piece that people are interested in. It, it's how do you manage the database objects that live inside Snowflake? So that could be the tables, the views, the warehouses, um, the file formats, the stages, anything in Snowflake. How do you manage that in code and how do you deploy that? And this is what we're going to spend most of the time today talking about. But there are other things as well. So you have generally two categories of tools that you're working with if you're doing data engineering. You have replication tools, and you've got integration tools like ELT, ETL tools. And so you got to think for each of those, you have to think through um, how do I store the definitions for those jobs, for those tools in code, and how do I deploy that? And how do I move that between environments? So how do I take my, what you know, whatever, uh, tool you're using here for data integration how do i take the the jobs that i've created in those and deploy them from dev to test to prod so you really got to think about all these and stitch that all together so i think we've got this hopefully now framed up we're going to drill into database change management in particular and talk through what it is and why it's different for databases okay so the challenges with database devops this is a study done uh, by Redgate, and they have a 2020 version, which I just looked at. I'll probably need to update these slides. The, it didn't change a lot in 2020, so I've left them for now. And they've done some like you know year-over-year -year comparisons and things. But I mean, you know, probably slow progress, but not dramatically changed. This will still be very relevant. So the greatest. This was one of the questions. What do you consider to be the greatest challenge in integrating database changes into a DevOps process? And 31%, the, the majority here, recognize that synchronizing the application and database changes together are, are the toughest thing. And that really has to do even with data engineering, you know, synchronizing database changes with your ETL tool changes is, is tricky. And so that's a big one. Uh, different approaches for doing DevOps between database and applications. We'll talk about that one a little more. And then, and, and so on. So we'll, we'll cover back to some of these, but uh, Preserving, protecting critical business data is very foundational. You know, an application is different. You can just deploy and replace what's there. But a when you're talking about a database, especially like a data warehouse, you're trying to, all that data is critical and you've collected it. You know, it might not even exist in the source systems anymore. And you have to preserve that. It's critical. So, so those are the some of the challenges. A couple other quick ones. I like this one because it compares, you can see visually, application developers doing DevOps versus database developers doing DevOps and which of the kind of key DevOps practices are being adopted. And you can see like version control, like literally this is the most foundational important thing. Applications, 83% of folks that are building applications use version control, but only a little over half for the databases. And I've seen this just a lot in my experience working with customers. Uh, most places, especially smaller places, don't have any source control at all. And then there's other issues or other areas here, of course, like uh, test automation is a really big one. How do you, if we're like we talked about with the, that scale from agile to DevOps, we need to be able to automate as much as possible and testing is really important. It, that's one of the things that's the most, it's the slowest and also the biggest chance for introducing risk and errors, bugs. So that's, and you can see very few people do it for databases because it's tricky. Uh, automated deployment, same thing, only a quarter compared to a half that do that. And then, you know, the, the quick yes, no question, is database part of your automated build deploy process? 66, two thirds, two thirds of people say no, and then, only, then a third yes. So, so we definitely have a lot of work to do in this space. 
the challenge though with the, the reason it's tricky um, for application development it's been you know devops has been around for longer there's a different set of challenges there but with databases there's a few unique things so we talked already a little bit about state that application code is stateless you just generally deploy and replace what was there with databases though you have that critical business data that especially a data warehouse where you're collecting and storing all this data over time and enriching it you have to protect it you can't lose you can't lose data or corrupt data as when, as you're deploying and making changes um, downtime is different with applications it's really easy to swap servers in and out with load balancers you can you can essentially deploy up changes to your application without ever having any downtime databases are tougher uh, because they're very difficult to swap in and out and i've got well you know some of these as i go through we'll talk about you know how snowflake enables this but snowflake dramatically makes most of these issues much easier for devops uh, sometimes you can swap tables there's some tricks for do, for managing this but the point is you have to make sure you don't have downtime and it's trickier it's more challenging with databases rolling back is very tricky you know if anybody's done any uh, of this work before you got to take backups and because you have to restore the data and that's time consuming and challenging you have to basically have you know backup structures happening or schedules happening all the time if something goes wrong you have to restore it to maybe a different instance of the database you got to figure out how to swap things when you're done um, and that's challenging and with snowflake in particular we'll talk about you know with, with time travel we can eliminate the need to have backups and make the rollback very easy so that's another one testing i mentioned already very e it's much easier to do unit tests with code there's a whole bunch of tools and frameworks around it. For data, it's tough. Unit testing is tough because it means you have to basically have tools to generate test data and manage them, and it gets complicated really quick, and it's very difficult to do right. And there's some other other ones as well, but you can see, you know, from a high level here, the databases introduce some unique challenges we have to overcome with DevOps, and Snowflake helps eliminate a lot or helps uh, manage a lot of these risks and challenges and remove them, which is awesome. But we have to still think through each of these things okay so the next now we're going to transition specifically into talking about database change management approaches and tools so if you remember from the football diagram we had the three different um or the four different areas we had the, the cloud resources we had the database change management and then we had like data replication tools and etl tools so now we're specifically focusing in on that database change management side, which is the database objects. So if you look, there's just a visual representation of the objects in Snowflake, and they're color coded according to account level objects or schema level objects. And you can see the, the, our task with database change management is how do we manage these things? How do we store the definitions for these things in code? And how do we deploy them to different environments? Right. So that's the fundamental task we're, we're focused on. So it's really important to understand the two different approaches for database change management. There are, there's imperative and declarative. And I'll specifically, we'll talk about each of these for, for a minute here because this is really important. So an imperative approach, what you do is you, and again, these, are, these represent files. So you're, you're always storing the definitions and these statements in files, but what imperative, is is each change you make to a database or each set of changes it might not always be one individual change but each set of changes that, that go out together are in their own script and they're versioned in some way and so say a week ago you create a table foo that has two columns and then now today you want to create you want to add a third column to the table you don't go back and change your your version one script when you rolled this out a week ago this is what it looked like. It stays the same. It doesn't ever change. What you do for a version two is you add a new file, a new script with a new version, and you add the additional changes. So version two is maybe just alters the table and adds a third column. Again, it might be one change or, or a set of changes, but it's each version is a separate set. And so the challenge becomes you have to apply those change scripts in order, always to the database. And you have to maintain a state of each database with a version that's been deployed there. So if you imagine going from a development to test to prod, each of those are going to be in different states along the journey. And so you need to keep track 
you need to know that your development servers on version eight, your test servers on version maybe six, and prods on maybe six. And so you have to make sure have something to track that. But the nice thing about Imperative, it's very flexible. You know, as long as you you'd basically name your scripts, and I'll show you this in action in a little bit. You can stick whatever queries you want in here, and you're in total control. Everything you decide exactly what statements get run. So that's imperative. Declarative is a little different. So in a declarative style, what you're doing is you're maintaining for each object, you're maintaining one file. So in this case, with this table foo, I have one file for foo, and I change this file over time. So when when a week ago when I de deployed my table foo with two columns. This file only had two columns in it. Now, today, when I change it and add the third column, I edit the file, add the line, and check, you know, and it updates the file in source control. So that's um, that's how declarative works from a file perspective. And then you think about how you deploy that. So the challenge now becomes how do I actually deploy that change? You can't run the same script again because it'll fail, right? You already have a table named foo, you can't run create table. And there are some tricks within SQL, like if not exists, and some of those things uh, that you can try to add in. But in general, you can't run these scripts as is. And so what you're doing then is you need a tool to help you create migration scripts. And it's usually a schema comparison tool. And what it does is compares what you have in code, the definitions you have in code, with some database. And it finds all the differences between the two and generates alter statements for you. Or if it doesn't exist, you know, the, obviously the create statement. But the key thing there is you need a tool to help create those alter scripts to do the migrations. Uh, and then you can run those against your target database. So these both work. Um, there's, I think there's pros and cons to both. I don't want to make it sound like one is the perfect answer and one and the other is not. I, I think I would tend to prefer a declarative style. I think it makes it easier from a code perspective. You're maintaining, you can always go look at this file and see what the current table should look like, like what the definition is. You're declaring, here's the definition of the file. Imperative is a little trickier because you have to go back and look through potentially multiple files to find the, the complete version of what it should look like. There are some tricks with imperative. So you can do this like a kind of a baselining concept and you can essentially, um, you know, there's ways to over time reset and like essentially create a, a set of files that has the full definition at that point in time and start from there again. So there are ways to do that. But you know, the declarative has its nice ability, but it does require you to have these more advanced tools. Now, the reason I spent so much time on this, because it's really important, is when we look at the tools next that are available, we need to, we need to understand that really most of them are imperative. So with Snowflake today, there, there aren't uh, really any declarative tools, fully declarative tools that work. Um, for other databases, for like legacy relational databases, there are more declarative style tools. And so some people have they've come from that background. If you've used a declarative style tool before, that might be what you're expecting when you come to any database. And the reality is the tools themselves have to support it. So, so we'll jump right in. So here's a list as of you know recently, as of June. Again, or not again, this is my understanding of what's out there. Things change really fast. It's possible there are new tools that I don't know about or you know changes, but this gives you at least a list of tools to look at that do database change management for Snowflake. So the first one is Snow Change, and I'll talk about actually Snow Change and Flyway kind of together. Um, so Snow Change is a, is a, a lightweight Python-based tool that's sim very similar to Flyway. It's important to point out this is not an official Snowflake offering, even though it has you know the word snow in it. It's not an official Snowflake offering. It's actually a tool that was created a few years ago, and I've recently helped become a maintainer of the project. So it's an open source project. And we've just released, so James Weekly was the original author. So him and I are working on this now and have just released a couple big updates to it. And it's really lightweight, and that's the key thing. It, it works a lot like Flyway, which is a good tool. Uh, definitely a more mature tool, has more options. They have a, a freemium model, so you get some things for free, some you pay for. The key difference is, between that and then Sketch, I'll just real quick mention Sketch. Sketch is another imperative style tool that's a mature tool that supports um, validating and reverting like Flyway does with, with cost. Um, 
there's online if you search you'll find both for sketch and flyway you'll find examples of how to use them with snowflake the the difference though between like snow change and these two is really the how lightweight and how easy it is with Pyth because it's written in python how easy it is to use in ci cd pipelines when you start working with sketch in particular since it's written in Perl, which is an old language i my first website <laughs> when i was in college was written in Perl. but so the challenge is with Perl is to, you most of the agents that you run your ci cd pipelines on don't have Perl installed and so you generally have to have a container to make those work and once you set the container up it's not a problem uh, same with flyway you often need a container to run it uh, it makes it much easier and depending on the tool, you might, might might be the only way to make it work in a in your CI CD tool. So again, these are all those both are mature good tools. You just need to think a little more about the the um, how you actually use them in a CI CD pipeline. I'm a big fan personally of like the snow change and the flyway approach. I think it's very. I'll show you it. I'll show you. I'm going to demo snow change for you. But I want you know. I think both these, like I said, follow snow change is based heavily on flyway, and really gives you some. Um, it's just I think more intuitive and natural. So we'll talk about that. DBT, I am a huge DBT fan. I'll even show you at the end, a, I'll give you a sneak peek of my blog post that I wrote just recently. DBT actually can do a, a declarative style approach, um, more so. It's not exactly the same as you would expect, like I just showed you on the last slide, but DBT is primarily a transformation tool and there's this custom materializa there's materializations and you can make custom ones. That allow you to manage objects like tables and views without having to ever you know store the code the definition in, in a spot and it handles the, the changing of those gracefully so dbt can be a, a good tool for that and my blog post which i'll cover at the end here gives a few ideas around that there's a, a tool called sql alchemy migration or alembic they're basically the same tool and it's based on um, sql alchemy which is an orm tool so for application developers, they'll be familiar with what that is, object relational mapping. And what it does though, is lets you, the, the, I think the big downside here is you're writing all of your change scripts in Python, not in SQL, like the other tools. So it, it's just an awkward, I think a, a super awkward way to express and work with database changes and it's slow and cumbersome. So I'm not a big fan of that, but it's an option if you're using, say if you're using SQL Alchemy already and you like that approach. And then one I'll mention that's early, it's still early, but I think looks really promising is a tool called SQL DBM. And it's a SaaS tool that, so it's hosted for, you don't have to manage, you know, servers and all of that, or um, libraries and maybe containers and all of that. It began its life as a modeling tool. So it was really more initially about creating models and then it would generate the create table statements for you. But they're actually working right now to, to in, integrate and, and enhance that so that it can do database change management and in a declarative way. So it can do a schema compare, basically, between your code and the target and generate alter statements for you. So this is very cool. I, I will have to figure out, you know, how I haven't looked in maybe a month, so I don't know where they're at now, but this is something to definitely consider and keep an eye on. So that's, that's like I said, this there might be stuff I don't know about. Happy to, there's other tools out there that people use that are kind of more on the automation tools, so autom like data warehouse automation that I haven't covered here. But in terms of just strictly database change management, these are the tools that are that I know of that are out there. All right, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you now how this works in action. I find if you're like me, if you're, you have your development background, like you wanna see things in action because <laughs> it's seeing a slide is great, but really seeing in action, you kind of understand more how it works. So I'm gonna do that now. I'm gonna just quickly talk about what's, how Snow Change works. So like I mentioned, it's it's a very flexible database change management tool written in Python. So it's very easy to update and deploy. It follows Flyway in its naming conventions. And again, it's not an official Snowflake op offering. So when you look at the structure, the way that this tool works is very flexible. There's a project root. So you have the root of your project. You can have any number of folders. It's it's up to you entirely. This has changed a little bit. If you've seen this in the past um, with our new version we just released, we we fixed a bunch of challenges with um, dependencies between databases and all that. So this structure has changed a little bit. It's gotten much simpler actually. So what you do is just, you can have any number of folders, doesn't matter. And you have your scripts and I'll talk about the naming in just a second, but you have uh, scripts that you store in those folders and they're versioned. 
and that's it. We, the tool itself just scans through everything in the project root folder. It goes through every subfolder recursively and finds all the scripts. So it doesn't matter. Again, you can store, you can structure this in a way that makes sense for your project or your team, but there's no restrictions on that. Then the naming is really important. So there has to be some way, like we talked about with it, with imperative style, there needs to be some way to manage the dependencies. And the way that happens with this particular naming convention, and this is straight from Flyway, this picture, and I have a link to it, is you start with the letter V. So you have a capital V here for a versioned migration. So this is a, a change you're making that's version. Then you have a, a version number. And this is very flexible here as well, but you have some number. You follow it by two underscores, and then you follow it by an arbitrary description. So the rest from the underscores to the, the extension is up to you. And you just name it something that gives it a meaningful name. And then you end with .sql. The versioning is really flexible as well. You can use any numbering system you want as long as you're consistent. So you could have a two-part number like 5.2. You could even use underscores instead of periods for, as separators. Uh, you could do a three-part name. You could do a date kind of stamp. You could do the dates with, and time together as different parts. Like really, it doesn't matter. You have to just be consistent. Um, I tend to to follow this, you know, three level naming system. I think that's pretty helpful. And there's some stuff online about that in particular, but that's the idea. So this is what we're going to look at. We're going to create some scripts and we're going to run them against Snowflake, and you can see how this works. So hope that gets us oriented. Okay, so I'm going to flip out of the slide presentation here. And I'll start by showing you Snowflake. So let me zoom in a little bit just so it's nice and clear. So, so far, I'm going to refresh the objects database, the, the list here. You'll see we're going to create two databases. We're going to have a metadata database and a demo database. So not the ADF demo, uh, DevOps, or um, I think it's DevOps demo. So a different one. So you can see we have three here now. Okay, so we've got nothing there. I'm going to flip here to Visual Studio Code, which is my favorite tool. So if you've ever heard me on a webinar or in person, like I always talk about it. It's awesome. It's by Microsoft. It's cross-platform. I think it's like the well over the well the most popular editor out there now. Awesome tool. Uh, so what I've got here is I'm going to create. This is a project I've already got that's checked into Source Control. That's uh, I'm using Azure DevOps. So I'm going to show this, this demo is going to show Azure DevOps. You can use any CI CD tool. So what I'm going to do, the first thing here is we're going to create a couple, a change script. So if I go, I have, I've got a little cheat here. Um, where is it at? Hold on, give me a second under scripts. So I got this, the scripts here already defined. So I have to type them out for you, which will take forever. So what we have is if I create in this snow chain, this is my project root folder. So if I create in here a new file, and again, it's you start with the letter V and then a, a, a number. So I'll do 1.1.1. You do two underscores and then some description. So what we're doing in this script up here is we're creating a bunch of tables from the TPCH um, sample data that's used for benchmarking. And so we'll just maybe call this one create TPCH tables. Something descriptive. It's always a best practice in you know, when you do check commits as well, <laughs> to have something, a description that's like actually describes what's happening, not just check in or change, something generic. And so we'll give it a name and then I'm gonna take all these changes. Some of these, we won't do these ones for right now. Okay. So all I'm doing is I think it's six or eight tables that are being created. And again, these are TPCH tables. So. I've got my change and the key point, like I mentioned, these don't have to be one change. So these version scripts, it's actually better not to have it. If you do that, you're gonna have just thousands of files that are, that are it's gonna be unmanageable. So you wanna find the balance of, of naming them. I will say a question people always have, which I'll try to address now is, you know, what naming convention should I, should I use? You know, both for the folder structure and kind of when I decide how to do this, the files. And I really think that the help, helpful way to think about it is to tie it to your your DevOps, like your agile processes. So if you're use, if you have user stories and that's kind of your unit of work and you have tasks under that, I would maybe maybe you have a change per user story. 
you know, and so you can even organize these files in a way that makes sense. And then your this could be the name of this could be to reference a user story, for example. So just one example, you can think of any way that's so, so flexible, you can do whatever you want. You just got to think of a system and stick with it. So I've got my script here. And now just from the command line, I'm going to run, I'll show you we're in this, we're in the directory that has my one script that I've created. And now to run snow change from the command line, I'm calling my snow change script and I'm passing it a folder. So this is the path to the um, project root, which I just showed you has this one script in it. And then I have my Snowflake connection details. So I've got the account, the region, the user, and the role in the warehouse. And what it does, if I run this, is it will print out some de debugging information like the version and the root folder that you're using for your project. It will tell you which change history table it's using. This is really important. And will, I don't know why that got, okay. I don't know, we'll get that out. There we go. So we're using this particular table, metadata, database, snow change, and change history. And snow change will create this. So the first time you run it, if it doesn't exist, it'll create it. And you can see that we didn't have any changes applied and it applied, it says applying the script that we have 1.1 and it said it successfully applied that change. So if we were to go out to Snowflake now, we to flip back over and I refresh, you'll see we have two new databases. So firstly, let's just look at the results. So no change demo is my database that if I didn't mention it specifically was part of this script. So the very first thing was create database. If not exist, the snow change demo. And then I created a TPCH schema and then I created the tables inside. So that was the, what we did. And you can see now I've got the database with the schema and I've got my tables. So it worked. You can, one of the cool things about Snowflake, if you've used it, is the query history. So I can go back and easily see what the tool did. And this is just a good tip for any tool you're using to, to see what queries actually had issues against, against Snowflake. You can just come in here and look. And you can see that what it does, the beginning here, so starting at 1037, I can make this a little bigger. Uh, it ran some statements. So it created the, the, the database to store the changes in, the versions. And then it started running my scripts. So start, starting here, just it ran my first script. You can see it doing all the create table statements. And then at the end, it ran a, it logged the version. So it inserted a record into the change history table that had everything you need to know, like the version of the file, um, the message that you had with it, the file, whole file name, a, a hash of the file and the status, who ran it and the time. So all these things are stored for every change. And I'll show you here in the metadata database. This is completely configurable, where the, what table you use, and that's really important. That's one of the big changes we made recently. So you can store, uh, you could have as, you know, if you have, some people with Snowflake have their dev and their test environments in the same account. So this way you can separate out which change table works for which environment. And you can see I've got in my metadata database, a snow change table or schema, and then the change history table. And if I look at it right now, I've got one record in it which is what we you just saw the insert statement for. And you can see we like take the description, we even clean up the, we add spaces and capitalization and make it a nice description. So you have a nice history of all your changes. So that's the first, uh, that was running it manually. So now I'm gonna show you how this works inside of Azure DevOps. So what we'll do is we'll go back to our project here and we're gonna create a second change. So if I were to run this again, I'll just show you now. Let's do this. We'll run the same thing again. So I still have only one change script. And what you'll see is there, there's nothing to deploy, as you could guess, right? The We've already at version 1.1.1, and there's no changes to apply. So you can see now what it says is it tells you what table you're using again. That's really important. And then it tells you the max change script version is 1.1.1. And so it skipped that one file because it's already been applied to that database. So now if I were to create a second script and we'll call this one as you can probably guess 1.1.2 and then we'll add add metadata columns so one thing i'm going to do this is a really simple change but i'm just going to go through for each of the tables and add two columns 
um, a, a created at and an updated at timestamp. So meta created at, meta updated at. So I want some, you know, just general metadata columns in my tables. I, I forgot to do it originally. So I can take these changes and save those. And I'm gonna have to tell it which database and schema to use. The the tool doesn't force you to to apply some tools will force you to like run the scripts in a certain schema or database. No change is just completely it's up to you. You just tell it what you want it to do. So it's very flexible. All right, so we have 1.2. So now the way that to run this through a CI CD pipeline, which I've already got set up, is I need to check these in. So we'll update really quick here. And what I'll do is check in our two changes. So we'll check in script one, the first two, and we'll do um, uh, give it some name. Okay, so we'll commit those locally, and then we'll push those to Azure DevOps. And while that's happening, I'll show you. So let's flip out to Azure DevOps. So I've already got a pipeline created here, and I'll just walk through it really quick. You can see it's already running. This is my snow change demo. And so I'm just gonna show you that while it's running, I'm gonna show you the definition. So if you're familiar, like I guess two things first at the beginning, I'm showing you this with Azure DevOps. Like I mentioned, this can be any CI CD tool. So you're not, the same principles apply here. The configuration and the, how you define the pipeline might be, will probably be different uh, and what's, what this tools supply, but you can do this with any tool. And so you can see the definitions here. I've got um, my triggers set up. Basically my steps are very simple. I am running, I'm doing a, a task in DevOps to use the newest version of Python. And then I'm running a bash task and I'm just have some bash commands. So I'm gonna print out what folder we're in. I'm gonna do a pip install of the Snowflake Python connector. So it depends, the snow change depends on the Python connector for Snowflake. And then I'm gonna run snow change. And that's basically what I just showed you already from the command line, except for now I've got some variables. And Azure DevOps is really nice. So this YAML definition, if you've used it in the past, DevOps in the past, they had kind of two different concepts for pipelines. They had a build pipeline and a release pipeline. And they're very similar, but but different. They've now combined all this into essentially one pipeline concept and used YAML to define it. I think you know eventually they might have more of the UI back that they had before, but for now you define it all in YAML. And you can do things like in the library, I have some variables defined. So I have the DevOps and I've got all my connection details stored here. So I've got the password stored. I've got you know all the different things we use to connect. So that way I've got it all parameterized and it's it's encrypted and I can also then have a version of these for each of my environments. So let's go back and look at the pipeline. It finished successfully, whew, which is good because you're in a demo, you're always unsure if things are gonna work right. Um, and I'll just show you the output. One of the nice things about most CI CD tools is they let you see the output and you can go back. So I, used, I did the use Python step. There's some wrappers, you know, so it has to check out your repository and all that. Um, the bash script though, or bash step is the important part. So I, you can see my outputs. I printed the folders where I'm at, installed the Python library. And then at the bottom, which should look very familiar to you, this is the output from Snow Change. So the same version 2.1.0. Um, it found that we were at 1.1.1 and it applied 1.1.2. So it applied one change script. Again, if I run this again without making changes, it would skip it. And if I go back to Snowflake now, you'll see a couple things if I refresh and look at the snow change demo. So the first thing to see here is that we got a table that have our metadata columns. So at the bottom, I've got the two metadata columns that we added. Um, you can see in the query history, of course, those changes. So just like we did before, if I refresh, you can see all my alter table statements this time. So it ran it just like it should have. And then if we look at the, lastly, if we look at the metadata table, no change you'll see that change history i've got now the two different message two different changes applied so that's the that's it for the demo i'm going to give you a quick overview of one thing and then we'll have 10 minutes for q a so let's flip back to the deck and i'll present again so that's no change uh, again, for other tools, there are there's at least for Flyway and Skitch, I know there are walkthroughs online uh, that you can find if you do some search in Google. So 
giving you a quick sneak peek. So this is a blog post that I, it's out there now. I published it a couple weeks ago. You can find it uh, on Medium. You can find me there. So that's where you go. This is a, called a new approach to database change management. And you'll you'll see shamelessly, I guess, or I use the same uh, meme again there. But this is, I'll quickly just walk through the concepts and tee this up. Again, this is gonna be a whole nother, the blog has all the details, but, but I wanna present a different idea. So we already talked about, you have these objects in Snowflake and how do you manage them? And we just presented, I just showed you a way to do it. So you can use a single database change management tool like Snowflake. So you can manage all your objects with the one tool. And that's been the approach historically. This is a very common, these tools have been around, not Snow Change, but the imperative style tools have been around for a long time. People have either, and a lot of times people create their own. They, one thing we've heard from a lot of application developers getting started with DevOps is, Oh yeah, I just created my own process. You know, I have a bunch of scripts that I saved, and I, have a, it's, I just run those as part of my process. Something like a Snow Change or a Flyway will make that. There's a tool built for you. It's easier. It makes managing a much, you know, more straightforward. You don't have to build your own tool. So, but that's one approach, and this has been popular for a long time. But what I want to suggest is there's maybe better ways to do this. Um, so thinking about, you know, what you're doing, certain things aren't managed very well within a data a imperative style tool, or even a declarative tool for that matter. So things like users and roles really, I don't think should be stored in code in your, um, uh, in your your inside of your like source control with your a tool. They're better managed in your identity provider. And so things like we have Snowflake has support for a SCIM support, which stands for System for Cross Domain Identity Management. It's kind of a, a mouthful of an acronym, but, and that is a way that you can hook up to Active Directory or Okta and synchronize users and roles right with Snowflake. And that gives you a centralized place to manage it for your security team. And same with privileges, you know, I've done this a lot in the past, trying to manage all the, the grant statements and the privilege statements somehow with, you, you know, with the other objects it gets to be very tricky to, they're spread all over the place and to know where they're all at and to make sure you, with security, I think one of the, one of the key things is making sure that the rules you want are actually deployed correctly, it makes it really hard to, to track and monitor that. So there are some tools out there and in the blog post, I mentioned them specifically, uh, one is by the GitLab team called Perma or S Permafrost or Snowfrost or uh, something like that. And the other one is by James Weekly, who I mentioned earlier, who is the original author of Snow Change. Um, and they both are, they're great. You store the definitions in JSON in a declarative way. And the tools actually go out and not only do they create the permissions they should, but they revoke permissions that shouldn't be there. So I think that's a much better way to do it than trying to manage it all through, even through a tool like a good tool like Snow Change. And then the last bit, and this is what the blog post talks about, I think we can even go a step further, which is really cool. There are a set of, if we grouped up basically objects that are data sets, so anything that has to do with data. So that's the tables, a view, an external table, a stream in Snowflake. If we group those together and then store procedures are part of this, I'll explain why. Uh, using tools like a replication tool to get data into Snowflake or DBT when data is already inside Snowflake for all the transformations, these tools can actually manage all these objects for you. And in my experience, 80% of what we do uh, when it comes to like, you know, data engineering tasks is managing the plumbing. So it's managing the, 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 the files, like the create table and the merge, you might have the merge command or an insert update command in a stored procedure. And all that plumbing, which is literally just moving, defining and moving the data, we spend most of our time managing that and the changes to that where these tools actually do it for you. They automatically create the tables, they handle the moving of the data, the plumbing, and they do it all for you. So I've mentioned this in the blog post. I think this is a, a, a cool idea, really frees us up from, you know, like I said, 80% of the engineer's time now can be spent actually defining business rules. So it's a combination for ingesting data, it's replication tools. Once data's in Snowflake, DBT, like all the way, like it just makes it so easy. And then Snow Change, you still have to manage other objects though. and so. I think you know using Snow Change for that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm working also on a blog post to talk about how we can kind of integrate DBT and Snow Change together. So more to come on that. But I think thinking about it this way is very helpful. All right, so we're, that's it for the actual presentation part. Looks like we have about nine minutes. So let me pop over here and pull up the questions, and then we'll jump into it. So. Um, so the first question in here is, does Liquibase 
or is Liquibase supported by Snowflake? So Liquibase is another tool. Um, the last I looked, which was fairly recently, there's not native support for it, but there is a, whatever they call it, an extension or plugin, a third party one that works with Snowflake. So I think it can be made to work with Snowflake. It's not supported natively. I only included ones that were, that kind of had, that had built in support for Snowflake, but you can use, if you're using Liquibase already, you can, with that extension, you can make it work. Um, the next question was around, is Snowflake and Snow Change, or do Snowflake and Snow Change help roll back the changes deployed, not with another script? So the idea here is, you know, how the whole rollback process is, none of these tools solve it for you, I guess is the short answer. And so one thing that, if, and if you read in Flyway's website, they make it really clear. Like Flyway and Skitch have an ability to roll back changes. So you can create undo scripts, which are just like the other ones. Instead of a V for Flyway, you do a U for an undo. The challenge though is they don't actually work that well. And it's not because Flyway is a bad tool. It's because it's really complicated. And Flyway even says straight up in the documentation, like this really doesn't work in practice um, to do these undo scripts when they give the reasons why. So it's a challenge. No tool does it for you. What I will say though is um, Snowflake makes that task much easier because you can do it through SQL. So we don't, because you don't need backups with time travel um, and everything can be done through SQL. You can script out, and we do this in our Snowflake demos, we show um, folks how this actually works in action, but it lets you roll back changes very easily. So you can create a process then because it's all done through SQL, you can create an easy process to actually roll back changes, but it is up to you to create that, the script or the process for that. Uh, which databases are supported by Snowflake? Um, I'm not exactly, maybe it meant snow change. I don't know if that was, maybe that meant snow change. Um, so with snow change in particular, you, it just supports Snowflake only. It's a Python script, just connects to Snowflake, that's it. If you look at like Flyway or the other ones, they can connect to more. But that might, I think that was the question. If it wasn't, Please add, you know, update or add in there a question, and I'm happy to look at it. The next question is metadata, is the metadata database in your demo already created? Uh, where the snow change table is there. So the change table um, gets created for you. If it doesn't exist, you can, it will create it for you. And so that first time I showed you in the demo, when we first ran it, we didn't have anything, we had no metadata database at all. And when I run snow change the first time, it goes out and it creates it if it doesn't exist. So it manages it all for you and it manages create, tracking the changes. And there's a, if you look at the documentation in a, on, the, on our GitHub page, there's a parameter you can specify and you can override the location and the, basically the location and name of that table. So you could stick it in any database schema and table name you want. And it's just a, a command line argument you give to snow change. Perfect. And with that, I would like to thank Jeremiah for a great presentation. I would also like to thank Snowflake for providing the audience with a great webinar. Lastly, thank you to everyone who attended today. We hope you learned something new that will help you in your developer career. Thank you and have a great day. Bye.